Hi folks, welcome to what is a new thing for me, inspired by some of the folks like Keys Cook in the kernel community and Joseph in the Octo Project community who've both been doing some good streams over on Twitch. I thought I would try and share some of the ways I work within open source communities. Instead of streaming things live on Twitch, I'm going to be recording videos and posting them on YouTube. Don't know how long this is going to last. Maybe a one-off. Might last a while. Let's see. So I'll save my introductions for another video and I'll dive right in. Um, so what I'm going to do today, I've got a virtual machine that I use for all my Linux development. I've also got a Linux server that I remotely connect into. Um, I'm running Windows on my desktop because various bits of electronics test equipment and sort of vendor supplied software only seems to work well in Windows sadly. So I'm still using Windows on desktop and you remotely connecting into Linux virtual machines and Linux server when I need to. The problem with my existing virtual machine and existing build server is they're full of various bits of work for different clients, some of which isn't stuff that I want to be accidentally posting publicly in a video. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a new virtual machine as just a clean environment for hacking around on things on video recordings and it, it's you know shown virtual machine setup is something lots of folks have done before but you know this is the way I'm going to do things this is going to be how I partition things, how I set things up, what things I install um, on the basis that I'm not going to be using this virtual machine graphically, I'm going to be remotely connecting in over SSH and over the SSH plugin in Visual Studio Code. So, as you can see from the notes in front of me, we're going to be using Debian 10 um, for that's my preferred distro for hacking around on this. I use Arch Linux a lot, but I want something a little more stable for this adventure. So, somewhere I should have a browser window, which seems to have disappeared. There we go. So first things first, let's download a Debian ISO. Um, should be fairly straightforward to do. Um, we're just going to go with the kind of default install image for AMD64 and download that. Hopefully it should not take very long. Um, and we're going to set up a new virtual machine in VirtualBox. So thankfully this machine has plenty of disk space, plenty of RAM. So we should be able to set something up fairly easily. Um, yeah, let's see what we need for development. So I'm going to go with 16 gig of RAM allocated to this virtual machine because I will be compiling various bits of software and that will make things run a little bit faster. I'm going to create a new virtual hard drive and give this system 200 gigabytes of storage space. Should be enough for hacking around on the things I'm going to do, which is mostly Rust, Python, and kernel development. So 
So I'm not a fan of the sort of defaults that we end up with. So I always go through and change these. I'm going to enable EFI booting and see if we can get that working in Debian 10 on a virtual machine. I'm going to crank this up to 8 vCPUs allocated and enable um, basically the extended features and nested virtualization support. In case I end up running virtual machines within virtual machines, I don't see any reason why we should have a separate IDE controller in these VMs. IDE is very obsolete technology, so why bother emulating it? Let's add this ISO file that we've got. So that's going to be in the virtual disk drive. Don't care about audio. We're going to put this on directly on my network. And we'll come back to the IP address setup later um, using the MAC address that's been generated to fix an IP address in my router. Don't need a serial port, we don't care about USB, we don't care about shared folders at the minute, and the user interface is fine. Now it says invalid settings because we're using more than the number of physical cores, but I don't think this ever causes any problem for me. So we've now got you know slightly more powerfully configured virtual machine that should be useful for software development. I'm not allocating all 12 vCPUs to the VM because I do want some cores left over for things that are running natively on this Windows box. So let's see what happens if we run this virtual machine. We should hopefully end up with a Debian installer. So we're going to go ahead and go through the graphical install wizard. Now, I've not installed Debian natively in a, maybe two years now, so let's figure this out as we go. We are going to stick with English. I am based in the United Kingdom, sadly. And let's see what we get. Seems to be automatically trying some network configuration. I'm expecting this to work. I'm going to call this thing Deb10 because it's a Debian 10 based system. So my home network is home.b5net.uk. And I'm going to set some passwords. not show the password in clear, that's not a good idea when video recording. Cool, so that's our root password and I'm also going to set my usual username. I always get confused by this, it wants the full name first, then a username and then password. 
So I'm just going to leave the defaults on here um, for what I'm doing with this. They should be fine. Yeah, let's see what it comes up with. Um, let's have a separate home. I'm not sure how much space it's going to allocate. This my, my issue with using the defaults from the wizard. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll just go with what, we, what the defaults are. I don't, though. 17.2 gig of swap. Yeah, this is this is where I tend to disagree a little bit with the defaults. So let's start again. Cool. So we, yeah, we're going to manually partition things because there's absolutely no need to have, you know, 16, just because we've got 16 gigabytes of RAM allocated to the VM, we do not need 16 gigabytes of swap set up. So we're going to have a This is the, we're going to have 256 megabyte partition at the beginning, and this should be used as EFI system partition. It's a little bit strange having to press continue all the time as the, the button to kind of create a partition. This is a little unintuitive, but let's let's see where we get. Let's create a boot partition. I'm not sure quite how Debian is going to distribute the files between the SP partition and slash boot. So I'm just going to give it plenty of space in slash boot. I'm going to create a four gigabyte swap file for partition. And then the rest of the space is going to be my rootfs. And since I'm setting this up now, rather than going the defaults, I'm going to use XFS because that's what I've always used. It's worked pretty well for me. Cool. So now we've got something a little more sensible. We've we've allocated four gigabytes for swap rather than over 16 gigabytes. We've got a separate boot partition that's X2, so we know that pretty much any version of Grub is going to be able to pick files up from that partition. And um, we've got the required system partition for EFI. So hopefully this is going to be a working setup for Debian, I know this kind of layout works well on other Linux distros. Um, finish partitioning and write changes to disk. That's what we want to do. And then see if this results in something that will actually boot. When you've got a moderate amount of RAM 
or even a large amount of RAM allocated to a system, whether it's physical or virtual. I don't really see the need to have exactly the same amount of swap space available. You know, hopefully during day-to-day -day usage we're not going to be touching that swap space very much. So we don't need loads of it and we're not going to be using sort of suspend to disk on this system. So we don't we don't need swap area that can hold the entirety of RAM. So it's looking for a mirror so yes, United Kingdom. We don't have a HTTP proxy here. Upgrading software, so I'm hoping that it's going and pulling updates that have been issued since the installer image was created. Now this may take a couple of minutes. I always go with the default of leaving the pop count package disabled. I don't see any need for this system to send lists of what gets installed back over the internet. So we're not using the desktop environment on this. We don't need a print server. We do need SSH server because we're going to be remotely connecting in over SSH. And we do need the standard system utilities. We're going to go ahead and install more once we set up anyway. This bit should hopefully be fairly quick to pull everything in since we're not installing a ton of software. And it's installing the bootloader, so this is where the messed up partition I'd probably see an error, but it seemed to have gone okay. Cool, so it thinks it's happy. We're going to continue here, it should automatically. Disable the CD drive, so it's managed to bring up Grub. That's a good start. And it's given me a login prompt. That is a very good start. So I'm going to log in with the username and password that I set. And we're just going to check that we are booted via EFI. Cool. So yes, this is booted via EFI, which is what I wanted. And we have plenty of space available on root. We have swap available, we have 16 gig of RAM available. Yeah, this is looking good. I think this is set up pretty much how. So I'm going to take a little break and set up SSH keys for this system. I don't want to set up the SSH keys on the recording. I do want to just check we've got an IP address. So yeah, this is in the range, the DHCP range from my home network. And we're going to check that the network is actually working before we move on. Cool, we can ping a site on the internet. So this is looking like we have a very minimal bot booting system. Let's check sudo works. sudo isn't installed. Cool, so that's going to be one thing that we install. 
Let's, let's go ahead and do that now. So I have to use su and the root password that I set. And now we're at a root prompt. So let's first of all see if there are any upgrade packages to install. Nothing. So hopefully it updated everything during the install process. So we should be able to act install sudo. And we'll look at my user. Cool. Ah, oh, it's using nano as the default editor. I'm going to change this to vim fairly soon. But for now, we just want to have a look. So the group that's allowed to sudo is called sudo. Convenient. I'm used to it being wheel on arch and some other distros, but yeah, sudo is fine. So we're gonna modify my user account to append the group sudo to my user. And we see sudo in the list. We're gonna log out. And my user and log back in to pick up the new group. And yes, we're in the sudo group, and we should be able to run sudo using my user password. So yeah, this is this is good. And I think I was going to use sudo just to check we had everything up to date. So we're in a good position with this. I'm going to set up SSH keys off video, as I said, and then come back. So I've done my SSH key set up off video and quickly tested things out. Seems to be working as I want it to do. So I'm going to see if we can connect Visual Studio Code over to our new virtual machine. So I'm using the remote SSH plugin within Visual Studio Code. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to manually open the configuration file and add the settings that I want for my new VM. So these are some other things that I often connect to. Let's tidy this up a bit. So, first of all, for all of our hosts, we're going to say the user is Barker, and we're going to say forward agent, yes. In fact, I think I'm going to change that to star dot home dot be fine that dot uk. So just for the things on our on my local network, and then that lets me change these slightly easier. Um, AR2 is my Arch Linux VM. Alpha is my Linux server that's running again Arch Linux at the minute. This entry seems a little redundant. It's just to make sure that it shows up in the menu. I think I can actually just get away with listing the host name. So the other thing I'm going to list is my new dev10 virtual machine. I'm going to identify this by IP address now. Find log back in here because I've got the IP address. And just see where it is. It's dot one nine eight. So we say dot one nine eight in our configuration file. And just to keep things tidy, we're going to add make this a fully qualified host so that hopefully these settings at the top will apply to it correctly. 
So with that in our configuration file, when we say connect to host using the SSH plugin, we should see Dev10 listed as a host. And cool. So as this is the first time we are connecting Visual Studio Code over to the new machine, it's asking us for the platforms that can install the right version of all the binaries it needs. So we're going to say this is a Linux host, and we're going to see if this works. That looks promising. Didn't see any error messages. We open up a terminal. It does look like we're on a machine called Dev10. And it has forwarded our SSH agent. So this is looking pretty good. Um, we are now in a good position to do some development on this VM. So that's where I'm going to leave this first video. I'm hoping to follow up fairly soon actually using this VM in anger to do some development. So thank you very much and I'll see you soon.